Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Restaking Summit. It's my uh, real pleasure to welcome you all here. Uh, I'm Sriram. Uh, I started this uh, eigenlayer project, you know, two and a half years back, and it has been uh, really exciting for us to see all the progress from there. Um, what I'm going to do in today's uh, talk is try to set the context for why we are doing what we're doing, what is our vision for what we want to build, and how we can all partake in actually. Okay. Um, how we can all work together in actually making this happen. Um, as you can see, the subtitle of this talk is the coordination engine for open innovation. Um, really, this is where uh, I want to give a little bit of uh, orientation around this uh, title. Um, to start with, uh, you know, if you think about it, if you zoom out, there are only certain kinds of positive sum games. What's a positive sum game? You know, when we are engaging in collective action, certain kinds of games are win-win or positive sum. So that there's a net positive created out of these games. And if you think about it, fundamentally, there are only two kinds of prototypical positive sum games. Number one is innovation. Innovation is when you take something and make a resource out of a non-resource, right? You can take air and you make spectrum. You take oil, you make energy. You take sand and you make silicon. Like these are innovations that transform like one kind of a resource to another, you know, a non-resource into a resource. Really um, highly positive for everybody. And innovation is also like this, that if I have an idea and you have an idea and we exchange it, both of us have two ideas, clearly positive sum. Unlike other resources, which are finite, and you cannot create more of. So innovation is one stereotypical, prototypical, uh, positive sum game. There's another one, which is also very powerful, coordination. Coordination is when many parties come together and create something which is greater than the sum of the parts. Right? If they work together, if we all work together, we can do something which is much bigger than what we can all do, just going our own separate ways. Um, and if you look at these two different types of positive sum games, there's echoes of this structure everywhere that you look, you know, in working systems. So you can think of like, you know, these two structures interlace and work together with each other in very powerful ways in different examples. Um, and one example is, let's say, you know, you take a country like the United States. Um, on the, you know, or any, you know, successful country for that matter, you'd see that basically the government acts as like a coordination layer, on top of which there is a free market, a competitive economy, which can be built on top of it, which is, you know, akin to open innovation. And what we're aspiring to here is for, to, to do this for digital platforms, essentially coordination via bringing decentralized trust. Who brings trust? You know, trust, trust is created through like this decentralized collective. You know, in, in our vision, Ethereum and Eigenlayer work together to actually create this. On top of which, anybody can build arbitrary new digital platforms which can compose with each other and you know, in our in, in our ecosystem, we call this AVS, you know, actively validated services. Or you can also think of these as uh, like a decentralized version of software as a service that we um, we see in the cloud. Okay, before I go into explaining, uh, you know, what all we can do with this kind of a platform, I'm going to start with the basics. Like for some of you who may not be aware, uh, just a couple of minutes. So. I can, in Eigenlayer, what we do is we bring together a variety of parties. So I mentioned being a coordination layer. What does it mean to be a coordination layer? You need to bring together different kinds of parties that work together to actually achieve a certain goal. And in our case, uh, it is mainly the first side of this is stakers. So what happens is in Ethereum, right? what you do is you go and stake your ETH. Stake your ETH. What does it mean to stake your ETH? You put it into a contract and then make a promise that you will hold to the conditions and the covenants of the Ethereum protocol. What Eigenlayer does is to make this much more expansive. 
So we call this restaking. Restaking is you stake your wreath and then you're adding on additional conditions, taking on additional covenants, making additional promises. Uh, that's what you, you know, is now popularly called restaking. In fact, we're calling this the restaking summit. But if you want to be really precise, you'd call it permissionless programmable staking. That's really what it is. What do I mean by that? So you take the ETH that's staked in Ethereum and then subject yourself to additional programmable sets of conditions. So when you stake it into Eigenlayer, you're basically saying, hey, I'm going to run any kinds of new middleware services, actively validated services, whatever we want to call it. But essentially what, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm taking my ETH. And normally when I'm staking, I'm promising that I'm running the Ethereum protocol correctly. But now I'm going to promise that I run all these services correctly. Okay. Um, and when somebody wants to build an AVS, essentially they are talking, we are talking about building two things. Number one, they can build arbitrary software, you know, a container in which they can house and deploy arbitrary software, and a smart contract. So Eigenlayer itself is a smart contract in Ethereum, but it allows anybody to build new smart contracts that talk to the Eigenlayer contract. Any new middleware or AVS can build a new smart contract that talks to the Eigenlayer contracts. And this, the AVS contract can specify the payment condition, the slashing conditions, and the registration conditions. Who can register, how much do they get paid, and how much do they get slashed. So that's the overall structure of how you build, uh, how we are able to use Eigenlayer to actually take the underlying decentralized trust from Ethereum and then supply it to any kinds of new middlewares or services that can then be built on top. You can think of this as the kind of open innovation layer. Anybody can build these new kinds of services. Okay, so in the last slide, I call this permissionless programmable staking, right? Why is it programmable staking? Because you're staking and then other people permissionlessly can create these middlewares and services that can consume your staking and then create new kinds of services based on that. So you can think of Eigenlayer as being a paradigm for programmable trust. Okay, so you know at the base of all of this, we have the Eigenlayer shared security system. We're calling it, you, another way of thinking about it is it's a shared security system. Why are we calling it shared security? The same stake or the same pool of validators are actually sharing that security to a variety of different applications. So that's another like, model for thinking about this. There are really two things that power the shared security system. On the one side, we have the ETH staking. People can stake ETH. And this provides a certain amount of economic security. Economic security means if you know that if your service is not run correctly, you, you will be able to slash a certain amount of ETH. There's also a certain amount of decentralization you, because you're borrowing the same set of node operators that you know, run something like Ethereum. You can borrow the decentralization, and this gives you a, an, a certain amount of collusion resistance. That These are distinct operators, you know, neutral set, which, which is actually participating to validate your service. So these are the two dimensions of programmable trust that are uh, created from the Eigenlayer ecosystem. And now, what can you do with this? You can actually start uh, building a variety of different things. And one way to like, root this thing is to take an analogy from like, the pre-crypto or the Web2 world. And you, know, you can think of in the cloud era, the, you know, if, if you think back to 1995 and you want to build an application, you have to build your own like, you know, server st stack. You have to build your own you know, uh, authentication, payments, database, everything yourself as well as building whatever application you want. This is what you would have done if you wanted to do web application development in 1995. In 2023, that's not what you would do. You would go basically use a cloud service. You'd, there is a bunch of software as a service solutions, SaaS solutions on top, like OAuth, like MongoDB, like um, you know, Stripe, all these things. And then you know, when you want to build an end user application, you just concatenate these pieces correctly and then you can build whatever application you want, leading to a much higher velocity of innovation. How can we kind of see an echo of this in the uh, crypto world? So, you know, one can start thinking about what kinds of, you know, 
the, the middlewares and AVSs, the actively validated services that can be built on top of Eigenlayer as something akin to these SaaS services. And then end user applications can then build on top of these services. So what I'll do next is give you like a little bit of idea of what kinds of services can be built on top of Eigenlayer. So you can categorize them in many different ways. Here are a few. So number one is roll-up services, like categories of services. So if you think about the Ethereum roadmap, one of the biggest things going on in the Ethereum roadmap is the roll-up centric roadmap. The idea that there is going to be lots of roll-ups. These roll-ups offload computation from Ethereum and uh, are able to therefore scale the whole Ethereum uh, stack. And in the roll-up era, there's lots of roll-up adjacent services that you know, may be interesting. And we're seeing a bunch of them being built. You know, we are building the first one ourselves, Eigen DA, the data availability service. The way to think about this is when you're offloading computation, you still need a place to publish the inputs and outputs of said computation. You know, if I publish the inputs and outputs of the computation, anybody else can then verify that I'm doing the computation correctly. So that's called a data availability or a data publishing system. We're building Eigen DA as a data availability system on using Eigenlayer. But there's lots of other roll-up services that we're seeing emerging in, uh, on the Eigenlayer ecosystem. For example, uh, roll-ups have a single central sequencer which orders all the transactions. Can we instead build a decentralized uh, sequencing infrastructure on top of Eigenlayer? Roll-ups take a certain lag before they settle onto Ethereum. You may want faster bridges, and there's a variety of different bridges being built on Eigenlayer. When the, how to handle the MEV that accrues in the um, roll-up ecosystem, you may want to build all kinds of interesting MEV services. For example, I want to say build an encrypted mempool for a roll-up, so which means you need a bunch of nodes. These nodes needs to, needs to participate in some kind of threshold cryptography so that when you send a transaction, no one node is able to actually see the transaction. It's encrypted. But then after the transaction is included, then it, you can actually decrypt it. So you can build MEV services on Eigenlayer. And another category that we've seen emerge is watchtowers. You know, if you have not one or two or three optimistic rollups, but thousands of optimistic rollups, which is the era we are going towards, you have to make sure that there are people who are actually watching what's going on in these rollups and trigger a fraud alert or a fault alert when such a thing happens. You need a neutral set of nodes to do this. So again, you know, a new category that we're seeing on Eigenlayer. So this is rollup services. Another category which I, I'm quite excited about personally is the family of coprocessors. How do you think about a coprocessor? You're sitting on Ethereum, and then let's say you want to run an AI application and then get the output of such AI application onto Ethereum. This would be an example of a coprocessor. You know, you're on Ethereum, you're in the EVM programming environment, but I want to access running all kinds of other outputs. You know, maybe you want to run a Linux machine uh, and a program, you know, for which you made a commitment. And then you want to say that, hey, if you run this program, then this is the output, and then bring it all back to Ethereum. Could be an example of a coprocessor. You want to run a database, a SQL query on a major database, and then you want to say the inputs, the outputs of that SQL query. You want to bring it back to Ethereum. You want to run like a ZK service, and then you want to bring you know, the outputs of such cryptography. All of these could be examples of coprocessors. We're seeing many of these uh, show up on Eigenlayer. The next category is you know, new kinds of cryptographic methods. Um, you know, I'll talk about the EigenCert service, which is a new uh, service that we are building later. But there are things like trusted execution environments. I want to run like a trusted execution environment committee. A trusted execution environment is a hardware device which has certain kinds of, you know, uh, there is a little bit of trust assumption in the manufacturer, like Intel and uh, AMD and, and Android, all of these different uh, hardware manufacturers have different TE environments. But you know, to be able to access TE networks on, you know, on Ethereum is a very interesting use case. You know, things like secret sharing. I want to take a secret and encode it and send it through the network so that nobody has access to the secret, but it's spread all through the network. 
Um, you know, more more general version of that is the secure multi-party computation, or you know, fully homomorphic encryption. We're seeing all of these new categories emerge on Eigenlayer. Um, there's also other kinds of things that one can do. Um, you know, bring proofs of various kinds into uh, the Ethereum ecosystem. What kinds of proofs am I talking about? Suppose you want to know like where a node operator is located, a proof of location. You may want to get uh, an attestation that basically promises what the proof of location of a certain uh, node operator is. And, and one way to do it is have a decentralized group of nodes which ping each other through the native peer-to-peer -peer network to actually then figure out what the ping latencies are. You, you know, there are systems like this being built. Proof of meshinhood, which is a new kind of idea from Automata, which is basically the idea that I want to know like how many distinct devices that you know somebody is logging in from a distinct machine, a distinct Apple phone or a distinct Android. Uh, you want to have proofs of identity. I want to log into a HTTPS server and then you know get the authenticated certificate into Ethereum. You know, there's a bunch of protocols like Reclaim building this. Um, there's also, you know, so all these other services are things you would want, irrespective of the fact that these are particularly Ethereum stakers, right? They need a certain amount of economic security, they need a certain amount of decentralization, but there's also the fact that because we're doing restaking of ETH, it's the Ethereum block proposers that are participating in the ecosystem, and you can start doing interesting things on the, uh, on the Ethereum side. For example, managing MEV on the Ethereum L1, you can start thinking about event-driven actions. Whenever certain sets of things are triggered, you have to actually, you know, for example, whenever there is a liquidation, then that liquidation has to be taken. And these, these kinds of event-driven actions, for example, improve the usability of these platforms massively. Because, you know, imagine that like you're running a DeFi platform and you need to calculate the time to, uh, you, you know, you need to calculate how much over collateralization you, you need. It's basically the time to liquidation, which is actually determining the over collateralization factor. And by reducing the time to liquidation, you can actually get very tight systems. Um, another system which is, you know, new, newly proposed is the idea of based sequencing where like, you know, it's from Justin Drake, the idea that Ethereum L1 itself can actually do uh, ordering of transactions for rollups. But when you're doing that, one of the things you may want to do is, how do you get like fast pre-confirmations? And if there is Ethereum staked by the block proposers on Ethereum, then and, and they're restaked on Agalair, then you could basically start doing things like pre-confirmations. They make a certificate that, hey, I am going to in include your transaction and send it to you right away in an instant. And then later, if they don't, they get slashed. So these are the different examples. I, this is not an exhaustive list, but the, but the types of things that we are starting to see on, on Eigenlayer. And the way th we think about it is the systems that build natively on Eigenlayer are like the SaaS services, which means they are infrastructure pieces. And end user applications will then concatenate a bunch of these pieces to actually build usable applications. And we are talking about how do you take crypto to a billion users. One of the things you have to think about is what set of like functionalities do they need? And that's, that's where we think that Eigenlayer will play a role, is at the core functionality layer. And then applications will just mix and match these different pieces to then get the end user functionality that you want. OK, so that's a brief overview of what the scope of the project is. And we're talking about to be the coordination layer for open innovation. This is really what we mean. And many of these things, we had no idea that these could be done on Eigenlayer. So these are all emergent. You know, Lots of people here have actually come up with many of these different things. And it's, it's amazing for us to just sit and see that once you allow this coordination layer, what all can then emerge out of it. OK. so. Um, in the next couple of minutes, what I'll do is briefly touch upon what is the f fundamentals of the shared security system. Um, when, when people think about restaking, they're thinking about something like, hey, I'm reusing the same ETH, some kind of leverage or some other concept. And I just want to dispel some of these myths here. So what is the core functionality of what is actually, uh, what Eigenlayer is actually doing? 
The first point is that shared security is strictly better. What do I mean by that? So let's forget that we're restaking from Ethereum to Eigenlayer. Let's just imagine that inside Eigenlayer, there's a certain amount of each stake, but it's supplied to all these services simultaneously, right? So one way to think about it is, let's say you have $1 billion restaked to 1,000 services. This is one world. Another world in which each service has $1 million staked. Which world is better, right? To, to attack any one service in the other world, you just need one, uh, one million, whereas to attack any one service when the same pool is restaked across all these services, you need one billion capital as an attacker to go and attack any one service. There is a certain rigidity, a certain hardening of security when you pool security together. We see this all, all through the place, right? Like this is why nations coordinate, you know, you don't have city, cities don't have armies, nations have armies. Sometimes even like many nation states coordinate to create alliances that actually work together. It's exactly the same phenomenon. Shared security is strictly better. There is a little bit of downside in that, which is in, if you had segregated security, you have something attributable to yourself. Each service has that one million, whereas in this, you get a little bit of mixing together, a pooling, which is good, but you know, if you also wanted attributable security, what we're doing in Eigenlayer in, in the upcoming version, not in the version that is already live and launched, uh, but in the upcoming versions, we are working on a design where you can also get attributable security. What do I mean by that? You know, if you have $1 billion stake, there's potentially $1 billion to be slashed. And some service, you know, maybe there's a bridge which says, hey, I'm very, very security critical. You know, if my service goes down or something gets compromised, I need at least $100 million of insurance of the slashable uh, portion. So instead of taking the slash portion, right now what we do is we just burn it like Ethereum does. In our V2, what we'll do is we can actually give you a portion of that slash funds and the ability to buy this is called insurance and you pre-buy it, and now you not only have the pooled security, to attack any one service, you need to be able to acquire the $1 billion of capital, but to, if your service gets attacked, you, you know how much you can slash uniquely. This, this insurance is not over-provisioned, so you, it is always guaranteed that you will be able to slash that much. So that's a superpower, so you can both get the benefits of pooled security and the benefit of attributable security, you can also start seeing that there are economies of scale, which is if you're, if you're using an application, the application is using several AVSs built on Eigenlayer, then you, can, you don't have to pay 5x if you're using five services, then you don't have to buy insurance separately for each of these five services, you just buy insurance once on Eigenlayer. So there is an economy of scale and then finally, there is an elastic scaling of security. You know, uh, Amazon's called EC2, elastic compute, right? Which is, I don't know how much compute I'm going to need. I'm going to go and buy it from a common pool. And there is randomness of how much compute is needed by different people. They go and buy the portion of compute that they want. There is a similar phenomenon in Eigenlayer, which is the elastic scaling of security. There is a large pool, $1 billion or whatever amount, totally sitting as security, now whenever like a different services, there are lots of different services, each service needs a randomly varying amount of security. Why? Because you know, I'm running an ETH to USD bridge when there's a ETH to USD price volatility, people might want to use more of that. There is a BTC to Sol like bridge or something else also sitting on top of Eigenlayer, then you want different amounts of security for each of these across time. And by having a single layer through which you can buy security actually makes it much better. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do from here is just go through the, um, let me just uh, run this through. I'm not gonna talk about all these things. Um, I wanna basically go here. Talk about our timeline of what we're building and when we're gonna deploy it. Um, so, the um, right, so the, earlier we had divided the Eigenlayer launch roadmap into three different stages. And stage one was stakers, stage two was going to be operators, and stage three was going to be services. 
And instead, we've redivided it now, you know, in our current launch plan in a different way. Stage one, which is already live, is eigenlayer staking. Like, you can restake your ETH natively or using liquid staking tokens. Stage two, instead of only launching for, you know, operators, what we're trying to do is we're going to launch the entire ecosystem. There's eigenlayer, you can have stakers, there's operators, people can launch services. Eigen DA, our data availability service, all of them will go live, except the economic part, payments and slashing. Except the economic part, everybody, all the different sites can come together and start creating useful services. Um, and in stage three, we're going to add payments and slashing. So that's our roadmap currently. And you know, we are on the stage one is already on the mainnet. Uh, we will have a stage two testnet coming soon. You know, definitely this quarter, hopefully much earlier. Um, which will go on mainnet next quarter, and then the stage three follows that. So that's the current launch roadmap of uh, Eigenlayer. We're really excited about all these different uh, new things that can be done across the different sides of the ecosystem, stakers, operators, you know, uh, people building new AVSs, rollups consuming EigenDA, lots of interesting things happening there. Uh, you'll hear about some of them today. Um, Thank you so much for listening to the first talk.